Jeeps I made, a Reed that I made, a ligature that I bought that's 40 years old, uh, my other car that has a bell that I made. And they all make a difference in how you play. The saxophone has uh, a custom deck, has a custom mouthpiece, has beeswax in the bell. Uh, so there's always things you can do to your instruments to improve them. You go to the NAMM show, half the show is about things you can do with your instruments to improve them after you bought them. The other thing is, is sometimes you buy a brand new instrument and it's not what it should be. Even though it might be uh, like a buffet clarinet, the number one clarinet but in the world. The truth is, one out of ten play okay, one out of a hundred play really good. So even if you buy a good buffet clarinet, chances are you have to take it to an expert to have it tuned, to have all, all the uh, tone holes flattened, uh, to check the board to make sure the board is correct, and other things. So, you know, instruments are important to get. All right. <coughs> Teacher prep. We already talked about how good you guys are. I really believe that. I, mean, I couldn't have made it without Leon Guy, who was fourth grade. You know, and, uh, he, he had a little professional band. He played bass in a, like a combo. He'd always come and tell us about his jobs and stuff like that. It's all fired up. You know, so. uh, okay. It is important to know what your students are feeling like because so much of, of what we do is about feel. And, and people that sound the same tend to play the same. Uh, I always used to like to say on saxophone, like, if I would watch a classical saxophone player, they were always sitting like this. If I watched a jazz player, they were always sitting like this. And that's why they sounded different. Because the tension in the body was different. So the tension in everybody's body has to match if your band has to you know, match. Now, I, I don't know how much it takes to play a double C on the trumpet, but it takes a lot. You've got to be a muscle man, I tell you that. You know, and I don't know what it takes to play a middle C on the trumpet. But if everybody's playing a middle C, they need to be working the same, the same amount. Okay, so that's that. Right. Uh, you know if your student's instrument is even functioning. Uh, that's something I urge you to do, is have them play it. And if it's not playing, Take a look at it, see if there's anything you can find, and if there's nothing you can find immediately, send them to the, uh, the uh, repair person. With, with woodwind instruments, a lot of time, it's simply the reed. And let's just talk about the reed for a second. Usually when you buy, you rent a, or buy a clarinet. Uh, on my website, avclarinets.com, I have a video about whether you should buy or whether you should rent. My view is you should buy because by the time you run it for a year, you pay for the buying an instrument anyway. Okay? And then you have something. Especially if it's a good instrument. Um, the read, uh, everybody, the, you don't know what mouthpiece you're going to get. You never know what mouthpiece you're going to get. If you're a trumpet player and you have a wooden player, you don't know what that mouthpiece does. The more open the mouthpiece, the softer read it requires. The more close the mouthpiece, the harder reader requires. So you don't know what the kids got, whether the mouthpiece is open. And what I'm talking about is right at the tip. How open is that? Now I know that that's, that's uh, 42 thousandths of an inch open because I made it. 40, 43 to 47 thousandths is kind of the range that any professional musician will play from a classical player to a, a jazz player. And I've seen student mouthpieces that are open to 90. Unplayable. Okay? So you don't know what they're going to get. So I don't know to tell you how to do that unless you have somebody that can come coach your class, like a woodwind coach. Like every four weeks, the woodwind coach comes in. And maybe they go around to all your schools and do it. I think that's the greatest thing you can do, or a trumpet coach. Or somebody that knows the things you don't know, the idiosyncrasies of the instrument. Okay? Uh, but many times I'll, I'll look at, uh, at a clarinet player and the reed will be way over to the side, which sounds like this. You know, but simply by straightening it out, it sounds like... Now, I can raise the reed, and it sounds like this. Hard work, right? Because you take the, the part that's hardest of the reed and shove it more towards where they play. Okay? And I can play the reed way below where it's supposed to go. And 
Here's what comes out. Now, in this case, I, I use a four read. And, and read numbers don't mean anything to me because uh, there's probably 50 different kinds of reads out there. And four means everything, something different on every single read. So the numbers mean nothing to me, it's just how they play. Uh, you do want to start your students on softer reads, one and a half or twos, generally. So if you can figure out, if, if you see the kids working too hard, bring the read back a little bit, okay? If, if you see the kids doing this, and, and closing, closing the mouthpiece, he's either working too hard or the read's too soft. And, you know, I don't know how you know which one's which, except for you try harder to read first because it's cheaper than buying a new mouthpiece. <laughs> Not sure. Okay. Uh, so that's that's read a mouthpiece. Uh, the keys cover the holes. You know, you know, usually if you there's a little pop, I think everything's covering. If, that, if you're in doubt, you can take uh, you take the top half. Do this. Suction. That's good. No suction, that wouldn't do that. Okay. Same thing with the bottom. You can take the bell off and suck from this in and hold this in closed. And and usually if there's a uh, leak, it, you, you'll feel it. I mean you'll feel it. You know. So uh, again I keep coming back to that instrument, don't I? I don't really didn't figure I was gonna do that, but really important. Here's, here's the deal, and I said it somewhere later. If a professional cannot play on a student instrument, what chance does a student have? So I know some people that were handed the instrument that they played their whole life when they were the first day they played. Now most of us don't get that. I remember breaking a clarinet in half. That was so important because I couldn't play what I had to play. You know, uh, and most young people, that's their frustration. The instrument isn't working. They don't know it. They don't, they're not good enough to tell if it's not working. And, and they can't take it to the shop every, every month, you know. Uh, in general, you want to take your instrument uh, to the shop at least once a year, okay? The other times you want to take it is any time there's a big change in weather, like we just had, okay? All of a sudden, all those pads are puffing up, they're getting really big, the corks are getting bigger because it's the, the uh, moisture is getting into everything. The, even the bore of the clarinet changes a little bit. So that's a good time after it's been raining a lot to go to a repair person. The same thing in, in the summer, in the middle of the summer, when it's really dry and really hot. Then those pads shrink, the clarinet shrinks, the cork pads shrink, and that's another good time. Now, if you have a great instrument, you may get through the whole thing. I, my clarinet, I had overall my buffet, I had overall uh, 11 years ago. And every year I'd take it to the repairman and say, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Well, finally, after the 11th year, the guy says, I think you have two pads that aren't sealing. That's how good a good repairman can make the instrument. The kids aren't fighting with their instruments. Okay? So, uh, that's the other thing. You need to know a good repair person. It may or may not be the person in your district. Okay, my, my, uh, my idea is that the instrument the, uh, the student started with it should be a new instrument because you just don't know the quality of the instrument. If you go to a music store where the person's a woodwind player, you're probably going to get a hard to play because they care. But you probably wouldn't get a trumpet from them to play because they don't know unless they have a trumpet player that's a repair person there, and they care. That's it. They have to care, because they're, they're really, they're retailers. You know, they're in it to make money. They're not make, in it to make a kid be the best player in the world. It would be nice if they were, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're not against that, but, you know, they'd rather make the rent over a year or two and get through that. Okay, uh, we'll look at the instrument. We talked about that. Actually, with all your instruments. The other thing is, it's important to know where to hold the instruments. Where do you hold the clarinet? I hold it two places. In my mouth and with my thumb. That's where I hold it. Sometimes I'll have kids hold it here because what I find is to hold it up like this, 
they start using their finger under these keys. And what happens is you roll over and then you start squeaking as you're rolling over on this key. So that's an optional third point that when you can break them of it, you break it, break them of it. No. Where do you hold a flute? Oh. Now flute's a very, very different instrument than most woodwind instruments. Because it's got nothing can go. You can't force it to work. It's this little thing that's hanging out in the air, and you have to bring it to your body and have this gorgeous tone like a 16-year-old girl who's been studying for 50 years. So where are you going to hold the instrument? Underneath here, the little finger, this finger held back like this. So what you're actually doing is you're I see a lot of people do this. They're cramming the, the flute against their face, which does this. So you hear that's done. It's good. So the idea is, is that you lay the flute in your hand over your first finger, under over your first finger like this, and and the first finger actually is kind of cradling the flute. And the wrist is bent, and your elbow is into your body. Because if you do this, it's very hard not to do, not to press. Okay, I tend to press a little bit, but my teacher never liked it. So, little finger, thumb, first finger, and the bottom of your leg. Oh, 
the cylinder. It's in there because I'm getting air through the instrument no matter how loud I play. And that's what you want to do on all woodwind instruments is make sure that the air is getting through the instrument. Okay? And, and uh, what I do a lot with my students is, uh, first of all, let me say this, it's, it's easier to get somebody that plays like this to play good than somebody that plays like this. They just don't want to blow. It's easy to, it's easy to, to take something and just refine it. But it's hard to get somebody to let go. And you really use their air. Okay? So you always want to be encouraging the people that, that are playing quite a lot of them. Come on, you, you got more. Take a bigger breath. So, uh, what I do is I put my hand underneath the, the clarinet player's uh, bell. I say, blow up my hand. And when they finally get it, an extra, an extra uh, overtone pops up. They go, oh. I say, okay, now do it and play soft. And it's more work for them, but occasionally they'll get the over, overtone. That's when they know how to blow. When you can play soft and still get that extra overtone that's in the instrument, you got it. That's the secret of blowing. It takes a long time. It took a long time for me. You know? and, uh, I mean, I don't know if I, I, I knew that until I've been a professional for 20 years. I mean, that, that's how hard it is. Because I was never taught that. Now, I've got students that were taught that. I've got an 80-year-old student that I taught that to that, uh, that learned it in about a year. And he hadn't played in like 50 years. He'd been, been in the Army band. And uh, he was just amazed. He sounded like a clarinet player again. You know? and, uh, and, and he even went to the, the community band that night. That's another thing for you guys that are running a new instrument. Turn a community band. Fun. And you get to play a new instrument or your old instrument. Great stuff. Anyway, he went to the community band, and somebody heard him warming up there, the instructor heard him warming up. He said, well, you sound good. You move up to second this year. And he's been at second ever since. You know? And now, now, he, now if I could talk him into that he's good enough for first, he could play first. He's good enough. He just doesn't believe it. You know? and that's a lot, another thing, how, how we think about ourselves. You know? that's, uh, the psychology of music is unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, Tony Bennett says it takes 30 years to learn how to walk on stage. And whenever I've done solo work, I don't have 30 years of work of experience doing it. You know, I mean, I might do it every year, but I don't have 30 years of doing it every week, you know, like he does. And it's, you know, you gotta talk to yourself, you know. When you're younger, it's easier because you don't care. You're not supposed to be better. You might, you're supposed to be good, you know. Uh, Mm-hmm. 